Good morning. My name is Dennis Mealy. I'm a partner in the uh, Fort Lauderdale office at Green Spoon Martyr. Um, my practice is land use. Also joining us on the panel this morning are Maiteus Koitsa, who's the deputy county attorney for Broward County and in charge of land use matters for the county attorney's office. Also, Elaine Bolu, who is the city attorney for the city of Fort Lauderdale, and also Sam Gorin. Uh, Sam is the city attorney for a number of cities in Broward County, and his law firm uh, is also city attorneys for a number of cities in addition to the ones that Sam handles. What we're gonna talk about this morning is how we have been handling public hearings and other land use hearings for uh, during this time of the coronavirus where people cannot be there necessarily in person. So um, maybe we could start off, Elaine, you could give us a little bit of the experience you've had in Fort Lauderdale. I know that we have issues with how we notice the meetings, how we make sure people can participate, how we make sure that we have proper quasi-judicial procedures, et cetera. Yes, uh, good morning. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, yes, we've had a, a challenging year as, as many of you have had and experienced uh, yourselves. Um, we uh, initially had uh, obviously no meetings whatsoever. Uh, they were canceled for quite some time. Um, surprisingly though, with everything that's happened with COVID, we have seen an, uh, an uptick in the amount of development applications we've received. We typically average about uh, 500 to 550 a year. Um, over the last five years or so, we're already at 596 this year. So business hasn't slowed down, but it was delayed for quite some time. Um, as I was indicating to some of the panelists earlier, the city of Fort Lauderdale had some uh, technical, technological challenges at the beginning because our technology harkened back to the 1980s. And um, so we did the best we could, but for quasi-judicial matters, obviously, or, or with evidentiary uh, uh, components to it was, was challenging. Um, we were able to perfect that. We expended uh, quite a bit of money in, in investing in new technology, uh, but we held off probably last for planning and zoning and the variety of quasi-judicial uh, hearings, uh, board of adjustments, things of that sort, um, because we wanted to ensure our capability uh, and the applicant's ap uh, ability to, uh, to present their case uh, fairly so we didn't have any due process issues. Uh, once we perfected that a couple months ago, uh, we were able to start, uh, obviously, uh, processing the more pressing matters um, with planning and zoning and then ultimately the, uh, the city commission. And, and we've actually progressed rather well. Uh, I think we, I don't, I can't say that we've perfected it, but we certainly, uh, and, and the developers and those presenting the applicants have actually adapted very well. Also, um, we had... Uh, a site plan approval uh, for large development actually at our last meeting and the developer did an excellent job in making the presentation with just a share screen uh, for the city commission. So we, uh, we've made strides uh, now that we potentially are going back public um, with, with less of a virtual environment. I think we were, we're there and we certainly have the capability in the future should we have to, to restart a full, a full uh, a virtual setting again but there may be some components you know we're obviously going to continue with, with some virtual settings obviously with with all the restrictions that are still going to remain um so it, it was a good exercise in that regard uh, thankfully for us although there was delay um for some development and and, and other applications um it appears we, we've passed that hurdle and, and there wasn't too much too much damage done in that regard um despite the challenges so I see that someone has asked a question here. Um, Sam, maybe you could give us the answer. Uh, if we know that the governor's executive order allowing yep. these virtual meetings expires um, on Thursday. And so if it's not extended, what do you think uh, is the ability for local governments to still have uh, meetings where everyone doesn't show up? Uh, I know we were talking about that earlier, social distancing, or maybe encouraging them to attend virtually. What do you think? A couple of observations. Good morning, Dennis, and thank you for having me on the panel along with uh, Elaine and with Maite. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, exceptionally good question. One that was asked by the city manager of Pembroke Pines less than an hour ago to me. Uh, questions were asked yesterday. 
As we all know, the governor entered his executive order 20-69 uh, in March of this year. Uh, the date was March the 20th, which corresponded with the, uh, the previous day before when the AG's office issued their opinion, suggesting just the opposite regarding having uh, physical quorums. They required it, and that was their, the AG's opinion. But the governor uh, suspended you know, basically having physical quorums, and we moved into the virtual world in March. And as you probably remember, Dennis, um, uh, you had the first quid judicial matter in one of our cities within weeks thereafter. Um, and we talked specifically about how to, how to provide and ensure not just the rights of the applicant before the commission, but also the rights of the public to be heard as well. Um, and I think we did a pretty good job with, with identification and swearing in witnesses and taking the uh, appropriate steps to protect the process. Um, but the question that's asked is a very valid one. Um, I, as, as a city attorney in this community for some a period of time, and my colleagues, I think, will probably support the answer, um, I don't believe the governor is going to extend 2069. It expires 1201 on October 1. Um, I believe that he'll probably not extend it or modify it. I think it's going to be what it's going to be, and the end result of which is that uh, we go back to physical quorums. Um, the question is, does that also mean having the public in the meeting chambers? And that's the open question. Um, I think the CDC guidelines and other, other issues still apply. And at this point, we were chatting a bit before we went live and the issue was what, what is the difference between yesterday when we could have the public's access virtually through all manners of mediums, whether it be Facebook Live or uh, email or call calls or some other method of, of getting into the, uh, the process yesterday, but it would not be the same tomorrow. Um, and we're, we're looking at the issue very carefully in our cities to the extent that um, if we need to have distance separation in the audiences, that's certainly an option to consider. Uh, some of our cities are considering just not changing that aspect and not subjecting people to the risk of COVID-19, uh, but continuing the process of having virtual access by the public. Uh, like I said, it worked fairly well yesterday and it should hopefully work as well tomorrow. Um, and as Elaine mentioned, I think that the, the technology has actually improved over the past number of months. Uh, I think it was a bit shaky in the beginning. There were some issues and, and the rules that we had our cities adopt regarding CMT guidelines specifically and un unequivocally talked about um, if there was some deficiency in the rights of the public to be heard in their access to the process, uh, the mayor or the chair of the meeting needed to, to suspend the meeting until that issue could be fixed. That's only happened a few times in several of our cities where the communications issue were um, uh, at risk and, and, the, and the mayor took the steps of deferring or suspending the meeting until uh, they could be fixed. It's not a seamless process, unfortunately, you know, with echoing and with muting and with other, other challenges. But I think that given the question that was asked, um, I believe the governor will not extend 2069. I think that given that, that conclusion, particularly in, the, in light of the order he issued on Friday night, opening Florida to, 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 to level three, um, we're gonna have to address the issue of the public access because undeniably that one of the most important concerns we as city attorneys have is the fact that the rights, of course, of the city commission, the rights of the city, but the rights of the public to be part of the process uh, is still material and is quite significant. And we, we may be looking at a hybrid also, uh, where some limited number of the public may be admitted to the chamber uh, in, in some of our cities, uh, and some they may, they may not be. But the, the issue is making sure that they have a right of access. Um, not every meeting is a, is a public hearing, but it's certainly a public meeting, and we need to preserve that right. Uh, under the Constitution, and certainly under the statutes that govern their access. So that would be my, my generally, generally specific answer to your question. Serious issue, very serious. So uh, at the county, uh, I know that we've had some land use plan amendments that um, are generating a lot of interest in the communities where they're located. And um, a number of the people that want to participate perhaps do not have the proper technology or don't know how to use the technology. Uh, so certain things have been delayed, but now we're getting ready to put them on the agenda. Uh, Maite, uh, I'm wondering if you can tell us what you think is how you're going to accommodate the people that want to participate that can't necessarily use the technology, but are also concerned because of their advanced age and their health uh, about attending the meeting in person. Well, like Fort Lauderdale, the county expended a considerable amount of money on the technology so that people can call in and, and you, know, you register to speak and you speak for, uh, you register for a certain item and when it's your turn and you get called, they unmute you. And so it's worked fairly well. But as you mentioned, we do have a land use plan amendment that has generated a lot of interest 
Um, as land use plan amendment, as you know, is not quasi-judicial. However, the people want it to be seen and not just heard. So because of that, we, we postponed the meeting for a few weeks to allow us to, to work with, I don't know that it's been finalized yet, whether we're going to allow them to go to a particular place and there's going to be a Zoom type of meeting or whether they're going to be able to Zoom into the meeting. It depends on the numbers. Um, but but it's, it's, it's set, setting the, the precedent so that going forward now, post the governor's order, um, it's going to be an option. We can, we can, um, we were discussing, as Sam mentioned before the, we went live, um, whether we're going to have a certain number of people in the meeting as their items come up and then they go out for social distancing or whether we're going to have them in a separate room and being zoomed in to the county commission chambers. I, I think it hasn't been decided, but um, like, like everybody else, um, we have been having a quorum of the county commission. However, if you, if you look at the meetings, which, you know, are broadcast, the whole day is just taken up just with commissioners, and we don't have all of them. We have about seven normally, and we have two calling in so far. And that means that the county administrator, the clerk, I mean, the, the records person, and the county attorney are in the audience, and it leaves less room then for social distancing. So I don't know that we've worked out the, the, the particulars yet. But um, what, what has been discussed is having um, them in a separate room, having people in a separate room and coming in, kind of like we do for our regulatory proceedings, for our code enforcement proceedings, they come in as their case is called or as their item is called, or whether we're just gonna stream it from that room um, and into the county commission chambers. So um, it's been interesting on, on my side of these hearings as well, uh, presenting these things. And one of the things that I've found is number one, if the technology, if you're having a difficult time at the technology at City Hall, imagine what we are uh, from our homes or whatever. Um, but also communicating with the other people that are working with you on the project, the engineers and the architects and the landscape architects and the traffic engineers. How do we communicate with each other during these meetings when we're all in different places? So we uh, generally, we get everybody on like a group text and so there'll be a question asked, and, and Sam, I know you've heard me do this a couple of times, where a commissioner will ask me a question, and I'll say, give me a minute, and I'll get the answer. And then somebody will text me the answer, and then I'll tell them. Um, but uh, that has been an interesting part of it. Also, keeping the presentation simpler, not showing 25 slides, only showing five slides, because it's just more difficult. Um, I actually had one place where generally what happens is someone at City Hall will operate that for you. You just say, next slide, please. But I had one city where for some reason they thought it would look like they were helping me, and so they couldn't do it. And so we had to do it some other way. I thought that was a little bit unusual. Um, but generally, I found that the hearings have worked pretty well. Um, I do know that the people that all want to come there wearing red shirts with sayings on them are concerned that if you can't do that, it won't be quite as effective. Uh, but still, I think uh, people have been able to participate. I had one hearing where I think they read 52 emails. The city clerk read 52 emails in a row about how bad this thing was. That was pretty effective on their part. Anyway, uh, I wonder what you all have seen in that regard. I think we read all 52 of them at the same time, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's one of my cities where you had such a, a large number. Uh, the, the, key, although, the key, though, is, again, the public access and and we as city attorneys embrace the constitution and the statute governing that that role and several times i've had to make a decision which i think was uh, taken either well or not well depending upon what side of the aisle you're on uh, to deferring the meeting or actually ending that particular discussion until the technology could be sufficiently clear enough to allow the public access um, no you don't get to see the red shirts but you do get to see people's homes in fact, the diversion sometimes, and even you, 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 Dennis, have been a subject of that discussion. When you call in from your, your home outside of South Florida, um, you know, the, the background is certainly very intriguing. Um, but the, the, key, the key has always been, however, what do you do when you have five experts that you're calling as witnesses under oath in different places, which has happened to you. And I've been in the meetings where you've had to do that. And I think fairly seamlessly in the context of getting people prepared having them raise their hand, having them be sworn by the city attorney or the city clerk, uh, and making every effort to allow the public uh, uh, the right of access to your process. So that's actually worked out fairly well, uh, at least in our experience so far. And, and I think that uh, 
we've complied with the Constitution and we've complied with the statutes governing public access and public behavior, um, at least in every instance where you've had a hearing uh, before our, our commissions. So, I'm sorry. No, no, please, I was gonna ask you. Yeah, no, consistent with what with, with Samuel has indicated, you, I, I think we had to stop one historical preservation board meeting because uh, the link, the original link didn't uh, work. So they created a new link right before the meeting and, uh, but there was just insufficient publication and access to the public to that particular link. So we, we had to shut it down. We were not very popular that day, but uh, we did have to shut it down because as, as Sam said, we, uh, you know, we're very cognizant of the right of the folks to participate. Um, we have had complaints about the, the folks in the red shirts or the yellow shirts uh, because they're in, unable to make that physical impact. Um, but, you know, we, we had those constraints handed upon us and there's only so much we can do. And, and I think we've done uh, the best uh, the best that we can. Um, beyond that, it's obviously logistics. You've experienced it from, from the other side, but the swearing in of witnesses, we, we've actually done well with, with the presentations. Uh, uh, some groups have chosen to appear in the same room, same conference room and present. That actually worked very well, where you had the engineer, you had the traffic uh, you know, folks, you had the, the architect in the same conference room with the camera on all of them and they were able to just go from one person to the other and then <clears throat> interchange with an actual um, share screen, which, which was probably the most effective that I've seen uh, out of any presentation during this, these times. So there's uh, there's certainly ways to do it, but uh, but certainly you know, as, as Samuel said, we we've had those challenges, uh, which uh, um, I think now to a certain extent I think we're going to go to a hybrid model, where uh, we're going to have possibly the applicants uh, being able to have physical access to the chambers so that they can make perhaps a more effective presentation, and some members of the public, but as as indicated before, we're obviously very limited. Uh, with the CDC guidelines. Uh, I, I, my commission actually is the, the easiest board for me uh, because we only have five elected officials. So it's, it's, it is easy to manage the space with, with that few people, but planning and zoning board, and you know, we have over 40 boards here at the city. So some of them have, uh, we have one board that has up to 24 members. So obviously those are gonna be a challenge. So, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's been challenging, but I think we, we've done our best to, to preserve uh, the rights of everybody involved. You know, I think, I think the silver lining to this whole thing is that it's, it's um, allowed, at least at the county level, for participation by phone, which before wasn't an option. I mean, you, you can have some people call in if the mayor or commissioner asked for it, but generally speaking, the members of the public would have to submit emails if they weren't able to attend. So yes, you don't have the impact of the shirts, the colored shirts, but, but the good thing, at least for us, even though the county commission may be there a lot longer, is that people that otherwise would not have been able to come downtown and would not have been able to sit there, you know, waiting for their item <clears throat> are now able to call in and, and have their voice heard. So I, I think there's some good of all of this also. I agree with that, by the way. And, and just as a side note, aside from the fact of having public access to public meetings um, involving public client relationships, um, in, in the recent discussions we've had with your office, my take, particularly with the surtax issue and the CARES Act issue, uh, there have been multiple uh, members of, 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 of the groups that are engaged in the conversation on these calls uh, at varying degrees of locations ge geographically. And I don't know whether or not uh, under the prior circumstances, if those number of people could be as, as, a, as, as productive as they were during a seamless um, you know, dial-in where the platform allowed for, for communication among so many various people. Um, so it actually worked. I mean, the CARES Act issue is a classic example of county government working well with the cities, for example. We had a, a task force established by uh, the League of Cities and the City Managers Association. Uh, all, of, all of them were working very diligently to get to a conclusion with your office on a, on a, mm -hmm. on a funding agreement. I think, but for the fact that we're in a uh, pandemic situation, those kind of meetings would probably never have, have, have occurred. Um, and if you apply that, that similar technology to, to the public meetings that we discussed and Elaine alluded to before, um, uh, it, not a perfect science, but it certainly is a workable one. And we've come to learn that, that over time, it's probably gonna be workable in the future as well. You know, when this all started, I think a lot of people assumed that there was an absolute right 
for people to attend these types of meetings in person. And I'm not talking about the elected officials right. or the members of the board, just the public, whether it's an applicant or just someone who's interested in, not, in an item. And as I was talking to a lot of uh, governmental attorneys during this time, there was a lot of people doing research and coming back and saying, you know, there really isn't anything that says you have an absolute right to be there in person. Right. But then I did hear that there were a couple of places where there was something either in their charter or their code that did say that. Uh, I heard this third hand. I just wondered what you all have uh, discovered when you've looked at this. I would suggest, if I may quickly, I, I think that taking a look at the AG's opinion that was issued on the 19th of March is worth looking at in the context of the physical quorum issue. Because interestingly, the physical quorum discussion doesn't exist in the Sunshine Statute in 286. It, it occurs in Chapter 166 for adoption of ordinances. Um, and, and the AG went into great, uh, took great pains to discuss the issue of physical quorums and obviously ruled in a fashion which the governor disagreed with because the next day, the next set of hours thereafter, issued his executive order on, on the next day uh, regarding physical quorums. Um, but I think you're right. Uh, the, the, the public, in our opinion, does have a right of access, obviously. Um, and, and the current platform seem to suggest a, a seamless way for the public to get in. I go just supplement one of the things that Maite said, which is probably also accurate. You know, we're dealing with with a with a broad a broad based population of folks. Not everybody has an iPad. Not everybody has a, a laptop or a, or a desktop computer with a camera, and that does create some challenges. And I think that's been an open issue for us, which is how to get people into the meetings. So aside from the visual portion, we've allowed, as you know, uh, for call-ins, dial-ins, logins, emails, and and and, pain, and painfully sometimes when you have 52. Uh, emails that come in and the clerks reading all, all of them that don't, don't exceed three minutes or so. Um, it gives the people that don't have the, the, the same equipment or the technology or the uh, ability to get in at least that, that right of access as well. So those various points of access have worked, as my Tim mentioned, and I think they've worked for us as well. Um, sadly, um, you know, with the generation of people, uh, even my generation, I suspect, uh, is not com completely computer savvy in some respects. We've all had to learn about this, this technology. But if you put your mind to, to it and, and you have good IT people, I think, care very much about what we believe is legally required, uh, it kind of works very well, ultimately. And I've, I've seen the success of this over the past number of months with very few glitches, actually. Yeah, I, I, I have to support that very comment because uh, I, it was hard. And, uh, you know, I, I did have similar concerns with, with people's access. Um, and, but in a couple of meetings, we actually had a homeless person calling from their cell phone from the I won't call it an encampment, but the area near Strandingham Park where we've had some issues and we actually had homeless folks participating in our meeting via cell phone, was, uh, which is nice to see, nice to hear because we actually were able to help that person. But um, um, it, it again, proof that uh, it, it took some time from the beginning, but between telephones, uh, you know, iPads, all the technology that's out there and the access points, um, it, it's, it's a pretty good system. And I think potentially maybe better um, for from a public inclusion standpoint, uh, the only only so only so many people are willing to get in their cars and drive to city hall. Uh, I think we've actually had some some enhanced participation uh, from folks that typically wouldn't come to city hall on these issues. So one of the things that I've talked to my clients about when this first started, a number of them were nervous that if we had some type of an approval during this time period that we would be open to an appeal uh, from someone who would say, you know, they didn't have an opportunity to appear and uh, object to the item effectively. And my answer was that as long as they received proper notice that within the 30-day uh, uh, appeal period, they'd have to file something. So if you get through the hearing and you get through the appeal period, you're in good shape. Number one, I just wondered what you all think about that. And number two, um, what, do you, what did we do in the past and what are we going to do going forward to give notice to people on these hearings? I know that during the past there were certain ways we notified them of, you know, computer or telephone or whatever. Going forward, you might be doing a hybrid of notifying them the way you always did in the past about coming to the meeting with maybe some additional instructions or something, but also giving them an alternative of appearing the other way. So anyway, uh, Elaine, what do you, what do you think about that? I think going with that, if, if we do go forward with the hybrid model, I think we'll just have both notices on there. Obviously, all options available. 
Um, we have the website, obviously, that can give further instructions than an actual notice can. So we try to supplement and direct folks on our actual notices to other areas that can give them more uh, detailed instructions on how to participate. Uh, so that's been helpful. I mean, obviously, as, as Sam alluded to, we've had some challenges with user end issues where we've done all we can, uh, but you can only con you know you can only show somebody remotely how to unmute themselves uh, so many times. So we've had a few of those issues, but uh, from a notice standpoint, I think uh, unless the OIG uh, opines differently, I think uh, all the cities and, and the county have done very well in being able to advise the public on how to participate. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. You know, if I made the, the, the forty-eight hour the rule. Uh, yeah, the forty-eight hour rule has been of concern to all of us under the county charter that was amended a couple of years ago, and, and as Elaine mentioned, also. Our notices now are, 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 are far more detailed than they were six months ago uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic issue became a, a true issue for public meetings. Um, I, would, I, I had a moment of truth on uh, a Friday night, I was waiting for an agenda from one of our cities that's meeting this evening and I didn't get the email from the clerk with the link and I got very concerned that there would be a lack of notice and there would be a, a concern about the appropriateness of that notice. Um, and it turned out that, that our, our system and their system block delivery because the number of pages was so thick that it couldn't come through. I had to actually access it through the website. But as Elaine mentioned, there are other points of reference and other points of access that we all now as city attorneys and government practitioners uh, are, are cognizant of to make sure the public has a right to, to get into the system and to get the backup uh, timely. Um, but we've, we've had that experience. And one more thing, if I can, Dennis, I had my own moment of truth last week in, in Tamarack. I was in, in, their, in, their, in their situation, the, the, the commissioners, some of whom come to City Hall and sit in their offices and the professional staff, the manager, the lawyer uh, sit in their offices. Um, it was five minutes before the meeting began and I had everything logged on on my, my iPad and all of a sudden it went uh, screen to black. So I rebooted and I figured, well, that sure shouldn't be a problem and, and, it, and it wouldn't let me into the system. Um, and I immediately called the IT director who ran upstairs to help me to, to reaccess the meeting. But that's a moment of truth that we all have. Um, and we have to be thoughtful about, which is, and you were thoughtful enough to have us log in, the log in before this uh, session began. All those things are challenges and, and there's no easy answer, but to be patient, to realize it's not a perfect science and to, to, to realize it's not, it's not as seamless as we like it to be all the time. Well, one of the worst things is when it appears on your screen and it says your bandwidth is low, yeah. or it says your internet connection is unstable. <laughs> Yeah. I had that happen to me at Hollywood. I was on the meeting from 1 p.m. and my item came up at a quarter to 10 and I started getting your internet is unstable right as they came to my item. Um, Scary. So Maite, the county, it just seems has so many people calling in that you really haven't been able to do. I mean, you have a, a, a hybrid where you're watching the video on TV or on your computer. Uh, and then you're listening to it on your phone, but it doesn't match up. There's like a 15 second delay. Uh, that's been kind of fun. Uh, yeah. When you have this hearing um, coming up with all the people, I, uh, is it gonna be the same setup? I, I think it, there's, it's gonna be different because like I said, they wanna be seen and not just heard. So there's gonna be some sort of streaming. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not proficient at IT at all. So I'm the last person you wanna rely on anything I say, but um, our IT folks are working on it so that the people can be seen and, and not just heard. Um, I, I just lost my thought, but I, I was going to say, I believe going, forward, at least for the immediate time being, we're going to continue to allow a hybrid because um, right now we already have agenda items going on to, to advertise things for December, just because of the way that the, the lead time that's required. So what I, what I have advised my staff, at least, is just put both notices, and that way we have to continue to, to provide, you know, for, for access via telephone, um, at, least, at least until everybody is allowed back in the building, and I don't know when that's going to happen, that we don't have the social distancing requirements. Um, right now, we're advertising for, for both so that people can, can also appear by phone or whatever they're gonna do, you know, in person, whether it's in another room or, or something. So I, I, we're always gonna allow that avenue to remain at least until the, everybody is allowed back in change. <clears throat> well, Elaine kind of referred to it earlier about the volume of hearings and everything else that's happening. But I know one of the questions we have from one of the uh, people in the audience is we're anticipating 
more growth, more applications, more construction, more development, uh, people coming from other places to Florida. And I will tell you at least what I'm seeing with my clients is home sales are at a record pace right now. Uh, I don't know if that's something that has anything to do with the coronavirus, but um, they're, you know, they're just selling everything they can and they're selling it very quickly. So you're probably gonna see more activity if that's correct. And maybe it'll be good that we have more ways to handle it too, if there is more volume. Um, well, as, as you know, this, this kind of dovetails also on the land development code update that we just did. I mean, we've been working on it for over two years and we finally got it enacted in May. And the good thing about that is it encouraged electronic submissions. And, and unfortunately, coronavirus forced people into electronic submissions, which I think is going to go a long way towards expediting the process. You know, the other thing, uh, Elaine, you mentioned it earlier, that the easiest board for you to handle through this technology is your city commission. And one of the things that I was seeing in some of the cities that I go to is they didn't start the planning and zoning boards and some of the other advisory boards as quickly because it wasn't necessarily the case that the people on those boards had the technology to handle the meeting, whereas the commissioners usually have something that was issued by city hall. Um, so I know that was a challenge. Sam, you had a challenge for that in, did. in one of your cities, particularly. Did. What did they eventually do? I can respond very quickly. We, yes. we had the issue. We did have the issue. And, and we, we looked at the governor's order, um, and it makes reference to local government bodies. And we took the, uh, the approach that local government bodies included not just the local government commission members, but also the subordinate bodies that either can make final decisions or recommendations or some combination of both. Uh, and we applied it across the board um, to the extent that we then had planning and zoning boards and other, other subordinate bodies, economic development, any number of different groups that, that began to meet and that evolved. Uh, so much so that in some of our cities, the, uh, uh, we ran out of, out, of, out, of, out of the technology to have multiple meetings at the same time which became another challenge, which is a limitation of equipment and a limitation of access, which then became a public access question. So yes, we had that issue. Uh, we expanded our interpretation to include subordinate bodies and they're currently meeting in the same vein, recognizing that there are some members of some of those boards that may be of a certain maturity that they don't have a, a laptop or an iPad or don't have the technology or the knowledge of technology to, uh, to get into a meeting. And, and in those instances where there are challenges, we've actually had uh, uh, sessions with uh, members of the, the groups to help them to learn and to, to access the meetings but through the IT department, which I think has been very beneficial, uh, very interactive and very personal. Um, do you have those issues at the city of Fort Lauderdale at all? Um, well, we had the same interpretation. We felt that it, it applied to all boards. We, we, we took baby steps, obviously. We, we started with the city commission for, for critical matters, uh, very light agendas. Uh, ultimately, we, uh, we, we started planning and zoning in, in the, the, the more substantive boards, planning and zoning, board of adjustment, uh, those types of things. Um, uh, and then, you know, the, the, the other boards, not that they're not equally important, but um, those, those matters could be held off uh, for a while. So from a volume standpoint, like Sam was saying, uh, our IT department had to grow and, and we had to... Uh, to accommodate uh, large, large amounts of boards that wanted to meet uh, at, at you know, given times. So it became a sort of a scheduling uh, nightmare because if this wasn't just uh, you know, who gets to use chambers and who gets to use the conference room, uh, this, this was taking up a lot of technology and, and staff time and, and setting up and monitoring these. Uh, um, because unlike the county, I believe, um, we have all full control here. We don't have an at and operator or anything of that sort. So we have our IT folks running the meeting at the meeting. Uh, so we, it, it involves a lot of staff time and a lot of technology. So we, we did run into the issue of having too many boards and too many folks wanting meetings. So we had to take baby steps. We're, we're at a point now, I think, where we have a good uh, you know, flow of um, scheduling these meetings to allow IT to, uh, and the city clerk as well, you know, to provide proper notice and to ensure that uh, uh, the proper pieces are in place so that uh, it goes off uh, seamlessly. I guess I have a question uh, to Elaine and Sam. Are any of your boards, other than your commissions, uh, meeting in person or are they all virtual still? All virtual for us. 
um, if I can, all, all virtual. I know that my law partner, Jacob Horowitz, meets at the Cooper City City Commission. They, they, never, they never stopped meeting in person. Just FYI, they, they all, some majority membership is actually there, face masks and distance separated. Uh, they never stopped. Uh, in North Lauderdale, I sit on the dais with the city manager and the city clerk and on a, on a whiteboard in front of the, uh, the commission is the, uh, uh, all the commissioners. They're in different places, not always in city hall. In Tamarack, the commission members uh, spend time in their office or, or otherwise, and uh, the manager and the, and the attorney and the clerk are in their various offices. Uh, in Pembroke Pines, similarly, I'm in my office there, um, the manager's in his office. Some commissioners are actually in the building. The mayor's actually at the, on the dais by himself. So it's, it's kind of a, 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 a cross match of things, but, but that's kind of how it's been done. Um, but most of our cities, except for Cooper City, are, are not meeting physically in the same room together. And just one caveat to my answer, we, uh, our commission meetings, our boards have been virtual, but our commission meeting, the mayor has been present for each one. So he sits by himself yeah. and the city manager and I have never left city hall since all this started. So we're, we're typically here along with the city clerk to assist the mayor uh, with all other uh, commissioners appearing uh, remotely. I had a few items on in Cooper City. Um, and I think they were the first quasi-judicial ones they had during this time. And so we had to work with the IT people to make sure we can make our presentation. And this was one time where it wasn't simple. I think we had like six items on the agenda with, you know, all different. I think they made something like 40 motions at P&Z for the various things. They condensed a little bit of city commission. But it was kind of difficult. But they were all there, as Sam said, just kind of spread out. And there was a lot of people from the public that were there too. I was surprised. Not for our item, thankfully, but there was a lot of people there. I've had other places where I don't think any of them are there. Uh, one of the cities I go to, one of the commissioners is a, a registered nurse and works in a part of a hospital where she, you know, she never comes to the meetings, even if the rest of them are there and she shouldn't come. Um, and that's probably going to be true for her going forward for a while too, I would think. Yeah, we, we have been having seven uh, of the nine attend the county commission meetings um, for a few meetings now. And, and some of our regulatory boards are actually meeting also in person, you know, with the distance requirements and keeping people that have items before them outside of the room. Um, but I, I guess it's, we're the exception <laughs> because we, we have been having phys physical forums. So we have a question whether there was any other silver, silver linings that occurred during this time. Um, so I, I know it's hard to think of anything in that context, but I will say um, not having to travel uh, back and forth to all these meetings is kind of a nice thing. Um, and as long as they still run properly, what's wrong with that? Anything else you all have noticed? I, I definitely agree with that. I think there's a lot of efficiency uh, especially for us, and I presume it's the same for the county, we're sort of spread apart. We're not all in one building. So um, it does help internally uh, to have meetings as well as, as externally with, with, uh, with other folks that normally would, would take up a lot of time traveling. I think Sam alluded to it earlier. Another silver lining for me is the communication has been, you know, we, we typically have a weekly call with all the city attorneys and the county uh, attorneys. And uh, we've never had that before. And, and that's been really positive. So we can discuss and share ideas. And even via email, we, we sort of have a, a back and forth on some issues, particularly with, with COVID, but I'm sure in the future, we'll be able to, to, to transfer uh, those uh, communications to other issues. But I've had more communications with my fellow city attorneys and with the county attorney, which makes themselves uh, very accessible. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten responses from the county attorney's office on issues at 11 o'clock at night. So uh, it, it, that's been a great positive for, for me and being able to communicate with my, uh, my colleagues. I agree, by the way, the, the, the weekly phone calls with uh, Drew Myers and with uh, others from his office, from your office, might say, have been extremely collegial, um, without friction and very collaborative and I think very helpful to, to all the citizens that, that I think we all serve as city attorneys and our, our, our public bodies. It's been very, very useful and I find it to be very helpful as a lawyer in this community. Likewise, I reached out to Elaine and to um, Earl Paul at Lauderhill last week and immediately both were responding, city managers were on board. Um, so I agree that, that that's a very big silver lining out of all this. Well, 
for me, um, I found that there are certain people that working from home, you could get them faster than when they were working from the office. <laughs> <laughs> they were responding to emails at times when they wouldn't normally be doing so. So that's been a positive. Um, at any rate, uh, I don't think there's any other questions. And so we appreciate uh, everybody for being on with us this morning. And uh, hopefully you're uh, watching some of the other items coming up. Uh, they're showing you right now what those are. Uh, Maite, Elaine, Sam, thank you very much for joining with us this morning. Our pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Good seeing you. you. Thank you for having us very much. Thank you very much.